Yeah, in this video, I want to briefly go over how we work with tensors in PyTorch. And you will see if you are familiar or comfortable with NumPy using yeah, tensors in PyTorch. It's super simple because it's almost identical. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier in the context of computing, tensors and multidimensional arrays are synonymous. In NumPy, we construct these multidimensional arrays using numpy.array and in PyTorch we use pytorch.tensor. Note that there are also yeah, two other related calls here. This is like a .nd array and here's one .tensor with a capital T. So note one is a smaller letter T and one is a capital letter T. So on the right hand side here these are really more like the, you can think of it as these uh, data types or classes. So let's say in PyTorch, back in the day there was only PyTorch.tensor, which is yeah, the class, the tensor, it's the object itself, then or it will create the object. However, usually um, it's better to call it like this, which is a function. So PyTorch.tensor is a function that is inside calling this one, but it will do some additional checks to make sure the input looks okay and so forth. So in practice, this is the recommended one. And it will produce this one inside. So it's just like a wrapper function around this PyTorch tensor with a capital letter. So let's see in practice how it looks like. So here on the or at the bottom, I'm creating a one-dimensional vector. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm using NumPy. So here I'm calling numpy.array to con construct a multidimensional array. So this has only one dimension. So you can think of it as a rank one tensor or vector. And here I'm getting its D type or data type. D stands for data type. So this one will give us here in this case a float 64. So the float 64 means floating point number or a number for floating point operations and the 64 here means 64 bit. I will talk a little bit more about that in this video so be a bit patient I will explain why uh, this is like a 64 bit and why or why we care about that. Um, and lastly here there's the a dot shape which gives us the shape of this so since it's only a vector one dimension here there's only one value, but note it's a tuple, a Python tuple, which is where, why there's the comma. So it's a length one tuple, so corresponding to a rank one ten, a vector, a rank one tensor, which is a vector. On the right hand side now, I'm doing the same thing in PyTorch. So I'm importing PyTorch. Note that we import PyTorch as just torch in um, Python. And then here I'm constructing the same vector I've constructed on the left hand side but instead of using array I'm using tensor. It's just like a naming convention but it's the same, really the same thing as in NumPy. Um, yeah and then also it has a D type, it gives us the data type but now uh, it's float 32 instead of 64 so here it's a 32 bit um, floating point number so it has less precision. Actually, in most contexts, this is a good thing. I will also <laughs> explain this more in detail later. So this means it has less precision, but it also requires less memory or storage on your computer. And in deep learning, we don't need a very high precision anyway. So and then here, um, I'm getting also its shape. In this uh, case, yeah, it returns an object, a size object. It contains one value, which is here, yeah, the number of elements along that dimension. It's yeah, also equivalent to this three here. But yeah, note it looks a little bit different, but overall the same workflow. So PyTorch and NumPy are really very similar. Yeah, here's another quick example showing you that NumPy and PyTorch are indeed very similar. So here I'm just showing you how you compute a dot product using the simple vector A that I showed you on the previous slide. So here we are computing A dot A. Uh, note that we don't need a transpose here. So here it works without a transpose because this is a one-dimensional array. I think this is something I explained in the NumPy material that I also provided to you. So um, here we are 
having the NumPy version. And here at the bottom, this is the PyTorch version. So here I'm computing B matmol B. So this is the same as uh, B.B. So nowadays you can actually also do B.B. B. It's the same thing. Historically, people yeah, use the term matmol to do um, dot products and matrix multiplications. So in PyTorch also dot is for both dot products and matrix multiplication. Uh, one additional thing, so B, the tensor that we defined um, on the previous slide, it's a tensor 1, 2, and 3. By default, if you um, yeah, execute it or print it, it doesn't show you the data type, but it's a 32-bit dimensional tensor, whereas the A here is 64 bits. Note that you can also yeah, get the NumPy representation of the tensor, which can be useful, for example, if you yeah, uh, use matplotlib. I think sometimes, it's not always the case, but sometimes I have, for example, issues uh, making a scatter plot from, let's say, um, torch tensors or PyTorch tensors. So in this case, you may want to convert the PyTorch tensor into NumPy array. So you can do that by calling b.numpy. So you can do this one. Um, yeah, and then this way um, also, but note that this will be a 32-bit tensor by default. I will show you later how you can convert it to a 64-bit tensor if you would like, and also how you yeah, convert from 64 to 32-bit if you need it. So in certain applications, it might be necessary. Yeah, like I mentioned, traditionally we used matmol in PyTorch, but uh, yeah, nowadays also the dot method works same way. So instead of doing b matmol b, we can also do b dot b in PyTorch, and also we can use the rather new, but yeah, like I mentioned, traditionally we used matmol, but nowadays we can also use dot in PyTorch to do either dot products or matrix multiplication. So this is b matmol b, and this is b dot b, and both produce the same results. Note that Python also has a fancy add symbol for matrix multiplication or dot products. Unfortunately, not uh, many people use that, but also that's a nice way to write that very compactly here. So you can also do it like this. So all three things are here equivalent. So you can use whatever you like or prefer. Yeah, here are some of the data types uh, to memorize. Memorize is a little bit uh, of a strong word here maybe, so you don't have to memorize them necessarily like for the exam, um, but it's more like a thing that you probably should be familiar with if you work uh, with computational stuff because these are words that also appear in different contexts. So um, with that, I mean the different uh, types for integer and floats, like the different types of precision. So there is something called uint8, which means unsigned integer with 8-bit precision. Unsigned means that there are or there can't be negative numbers. So if you don't need negative numbers, you can do uh, or you can you can use this one. So you can't have negative integers, but sometimes if you for example want to define a selection mask, this would be sufficient. But also usually there won't be a context in this class I think where you really have to do this. Might be something you want to look into uh, later on sometime when you yeah, make some of your codes more efficient, but really this is like something you don't really need to worry about it at this point. Um, then there are the regular integers where you can have negative numbers. So 16-bit, 32-bit, I could sh uh, should maybe write this down, like um, the number of bits, bit precision 8, 16, 32, this is also 30, uh, this should be, sorry, 64, 64, 16, 32, um, 64, 64. So um, if you just use or well, refer to numpy.int, this will be the 64-bit version. So it's the same thing as saying um, int 64. These are really the same in numpy. And the same is true for these floats. If you just say float or float 64, these are the 64-bit precision versions. So uh, what's the difference between 16-bit, let's say 32-bit and 64-bit floats? So the difference is really like the, the precision. So how many um, numbers after the decimal point you can yeah, display or yeah, what the precision is basically. Think of it as yeah, precision after or number of points after the decimal point for simplicity. 
Um, so in deep learning, it doesn't really matter whether we have um, 64 or 32-bit precision because yeah, there's also a certain amount of randomness in deep learning and so forth. So things are kind of a little bit approximate in deep learning anyway, so we don't really care about that high precision. So 32-bit is really sufficient in the context of deep learning. And it's actually when we work with GPUs even preferred because GPUs run faster on 32-bit um, floats. I don't even think uh, GPU supports 64-bit, but I'm not exactly sure. I only know everyone uses 32-bit um, floating point operations. And nowadays, even uh, people started to shift to 16-bit floating point operations on GPUs. If you just use 16-bit floating point operations out of the box, you will probably not, uh, you will probably find that results don't look very good. But nowadays, also under the hood, um, GPUs have sophisticated algorithms where they temporarily use 16-bit um, to downcast where you don't, so for certain applications where you don't need high precision and then return the results in 32-bit. So intermediate results will be in 16-bit to save memory basically. And I think uh, Google's TPUs, they use 16-bit all the time, but I'm also not 100% sure because yeah, I'm not an expert in Google's hardware basically. Um, uh, what I also should say, yeah, then the most important type, uh, point here is really the equivalent data types in PyTorch. These are the ones uh, I would say to memorize the ones that are tricky, where uh, th there are certain words that you may not be familiar with. So in PyTorch, uh, unsigned integers of 8-bit precision, precision are called byte tensors. And then, um, so the regular integer tensor, so int tensor, this is referring to 32-bit. And this is also something that is more general in computing. It's not only specific to PyTorch. If you talk to people who, let's say, grew up in the 80s or 90s, um, these were common words because back then uh, it was normal to have 13 Two bit precision. I remember as a kid I had a um, Windows computer which was for example running on 32-bit before things got um, shifted to 64-bit I think in the late 90s or something. Um, yeah so back then 32-bit uh, was like the default which is why the integer tensor is really uh, here equivalent to the 32-bit one and then later um, so if you have more bit precision for integers, you can have longer integers, like higher numbers. So people call started calling the 64-bit version a long version of the integers. So long, long stands for 64-bit integer. So in this way, here these 64 bits are equivalent to the long tensor in PyTorch. And these are the ones that are initialized by default in both NumPy and PyTorch. So if you run uh, NumPy or PyTorch, just um, for example, Torch dot tensor, and then have uh, let's say a one and a two, like two values. This will create an integer tensor by default with precision 64. And if you have a dot here, one dot or two dot, these would be floating point operations, and by default they would be in PyTorch 32 bit. So in PyTorch the float tensor would be 30. 2-bit NumPy, um, the default would be actually 64. Similar to the concept with integer and long, in PyTorch um, the float, the regular word float refers to 32-bit and the double precision, 64 is double the precision of uh, 32, it's then called double tensor for double precision. There's also half precision which corresponds to 16-bit. So it's a little bit confusing. It's something, uh, this table might be something yeah, to keep handy if you get uh, lost in the words in certain PyTorch codes. I actually don't honestly really like um, these names. I find these a little bit better here on the left hand side. It's a little bit easier if you just have the number 16, 32, 64 compared to double float and whatever. But it's something I think important to know if you look at code and there's an error and it says expected a float tensor, expected a double tensor. It usually means you have to recast uh, into a different type because you can't multiply, for example, a float tensor with a double tensor. You have to make sure the types match of these two tensors if you want to do uh, yeah, multiplication with, between the two. And I will show you in the next slides how you can deal with that. Yeah, so in PyTorch you can specify the D-type upon construction. With that, uh, I mean when you call Torch Tensor, you can provide the D-type as information via the D-type um, function argument here. 
Um, here in this case, because I have these dots, technically torch.float is not ne necessary. It's kind of overkill. You don't have to do that. By default, it will already do that. However, here, just for showing this example, you will see if I create this tensor and then I use c.dtype, it will give me a torch float.32-bit precision tensor. I can then also use torch.double. Remember, double means um, double precision, so 64-bit. So when I create a tensor like that, it will create a tensor with 64-bit precision. And um, also, I just tried this. Apparently, they uh, added yeah, more functionality, so you can now also use float64. So maybe they heard my complaining that this is a little bit better or more clear. So you can now also say torch.float64, and it will also create a 64-bit um, tensor. So if float64 is a little bit easier to remember than double, you can do that. Technically, you never really have to do that because yeah, most of the time we are happy with 32-bit in the context of deep learning. But yeah, this is just for illustration purposes. Um, you can also ch change the type later on or on the fly if you have to. So here is another example, just using integer tensors now. Um, so here the D type would be integer 64 bit by default. And you can change that to a double, for example, by calling dot double on that tensor. So it will change from 64 bit to 60, um, for, from integer 64 bit to float 64 bit by calling double. Note that I also tried, uh, just tried uh, doing dot float 64. Unfortunately, this is not implemented. So here we will get an attribute error. Tensor object does not have an attribute called six, float 64, which is a little bit unfortunate. So if you want to use the naming convention 64, float 64, because it's more, I would say, intuitive than double, uh, what you can do is, though, you can use dot two, uh, then torch dot float 64, this would work. So um, dot two is really like the long version of, of this one here. So this is um, the same as d two torch dot double. Uh, I think we don't need this. I think this is enough. Okay, yeah, so this is the long version of this d dot double. Unfortunately, they have not created a short version of the 64 here. So there is no dot float 64, but maybe next year, you never, you never know. So we won't give up hope yet. All right, moving on. Yeah, I guess you might be wondering now, so if PyTorch is so similar to NumPy, why don't we just use NumPy in the first place? Why do we even care about PyTorch? So one of the re reasons is really um, that PyTorch has this GPU support. So in deep learning, we will be doing big matrix multiplications. And um, in that way, we can yeah, perform these more efficiently on the GPU. So we can load the data set and the model parameters into the GPU memory. And then when it's on the GPU memory, we can use the GPU cores to yeah, compute um, many matrix multiplications in parallel, like taking advantage of um, the parallelism that is implemented in GPUs, the many, many cores on there. And that will really speed things up. I, I mean, it really depends on what type of network we train, but it's not unusual to have 100, uh, 1000 times uh, speed up. So whereas something trains on the GPU, let's say on in two or three hours, it would take on a regular computer like maybe a week or so and the computer would run really hot and you really don't want to do that on your laptop. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, this is one of the reasons that GPU support, but another reason is that PyTorch implements um, automatic differentiation or automatic um, gradient computations. So with that, we can automatically differentiate certain things because as we will be learning, on Thursday, yeah, we need some calculus in deep learning, like computing partial derivatives and gradients. And there are some um, yeah, convenient utilities in PyTorch that help us do that very, very efficiently and conveniently. And then lastly, PyTorch also implements many deep learning convenience functions. For example, convolutional layers and fully connected layers and things like that. So we don't have to hand code everything. And this allows us to implement yeah, deep learning uh, or deep neural networks very efficiently and also robustly in a way that is also working well in practice and free from bugs and also easy to read and things like that. So there are many advantages of using PyTorch compared to NumPy for deep learning. 
Um, yeah, also regarding uh, the GPU, just a few words about that. It's really easy to use the GPU in PyTorch if you have a GPU. So if you if your PyTorch version has GPU support, you can find out about that by yeah, calling this um, CUDA is available thing. So CUDA is a library for NVIDIA GPUs. I think there is recently also, or there was um, support added for AMD GPUs, but it's very experimental. Unfortunately, um, yeah, AMD is a little bit behind in terms of making GPUs available for deep learning. It's possible with a library, I think it's called um, ROC ROCM, ROCM, <laughs> something like that. But um, CUDA, the equivalent on uh, NVIDIA's part, is uh, yeah, way ahead. and. Many of these libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow use CUDA under the hood, which is like a C++ library for the GPU. Um, that makes also PyTorch that efficient because it's really like these low-level libraries under the hood. Um, so yeah, in that way, really uh, NVIDIA is kind of like a little requirement for deep learning, unfortunately. Anyway, so in order uh, to check whether your PyTorch version supports a GPU, on your computer, you can execute this, and if it's support, if it's returning true, then yeah, the GPU is available in the current session. And then, if you have a tensor, for example, B here that we defined earlier, you can easily transfer it to the GPU by executing this here to torch device CUDA zero. So why CUDA zero? Um, this is really like the name of the GPU, and you can have multiple GPUs on your computer. For example. Um, uh, I have one of my computers is a server which has like eight GPUs and then I have CUDA 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and I can use multiple ones at the same time and I can specify which one to use and so forth. But yeah, usually a normal desktop computer only has one GPU. So yeah, we can execute this command and then transfer things to the GPU. And then if I do print, you can see now um, the tensor values are returned with this notation that the data now sits on the GPU. And we can also transfer it back to the CPU by two torch device CPU. And th that way we can transfer it back. So we can transfer it back and forth. The transfer is a little bit costly. It takes one second or so. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but it's something that uh, if you have an efficient implementation, you don't want to do it all the time basically so usually you transfer your data to the gpu and then you do all the computations on the gpu and then maybe once you have the results once the model is trained then you transfer back some of the parameters to the cpu if you want to analyze them or something like that but also again that is something um, that i will show you later on in this course when we train our first big um, G uh, models on maybe the gpu yeah um so regarding um the gpu so if you want to check if your computer has a GPU, maybe you have a desktop computer with a GPU that could be used for deep learning, you can in the terminal execute the command NVIDIA SMI. And this is like a utility tool that is installed usually when you install your graphics card drivers. And it will give you some information about your system. So it will give you, for example, the driver version and then also the CUDA version. Um, and then it will list the GPU. So in this case, I have a GeForce GPU, and it um, shows you like uh, at what speed the fan is running, like right now at 24%. Um, then memory usage. So this GPU is currently not used. So zero megabyte out of 11 megabytes. So it's 11. Uh, sorry, 11 gigabytes. And then also. Yeah, how much, what the current utilization is kind of, uh, currently. So if the GPU is running, it will approximately be between 50 and 100%. And also, this is also something that can help you to debug your deep learning code. For example, sometimes you find that you're running things on the GPU, but if it only shows like 10 or 20%, it means you don't fully utilize your GPU. So maybe you want to make your batch size larger and things like that. But that is like more like an advanced topic. So here the NVIDIA SMI command is really like if you want to check on your computer whether your um, computer has a GPU that can be used. If not, don't worry about it because I will show you uh, free resources for using GPUs, uh, like web resources. So you don't really need a GPU right now and you also don't need to buy anything. It will all be fine because there are lots of free resources available. 
Um, yeah, lastly, so if you want to install then PyTorch on your computer, so I would still recommend installing PyTorch on your computer because most of the things in this class, because I also know that you don't have a GPU, most of you, I don't make this a requirement that um, you have to like do some GPU coding next week or something. So most of the homework will be um, possible on a normal computer. And I will also then show you resources for GPU computing if you need that for later homeworks. Um, however, it will be useful to install PyTorch on your normal computer, and that is also what I do. I usually write most of my code on my laptop, which does not have a GPU. So I write my code on the laptop, and when I see that it works, then later on I transfer to the GPU server to run it maybe faster or something like that. But most of my development work I do on my computer because it's more convenient. I have a screen on that computer, I can use Jupyter Notebooks and scripts more conveniently. On my server, I can only log in via the terminal and it's not so easy to use the text editor via the terminal, at least not for me. So I also do most of my development work on a computer without a GPU, like writing the code and debugging the code. And like I showed you, once you have all your code, you can just use the two GPU thing and then you can optionally run things in the GPU on a different computer. Um, so regarding the PyTorch installation, uh, so yeah, I recommend using the CPU version on your laptop. Also, I mean, even if your laptop has a GPU, unless it's a gaming computer, I wouldn't really risk running deep learning code on your GPU on the laptop because it can get very hot. And I don't know, I I, I would not trust running a laptop um, like for multiple hours on full power. I think it gets too hot and it could be dangerous. I mean, it could yeah, destroy your laptop, for example. So I recommend yeah, installing the CPU version if you have a laptop. Um, so how you do that? You would go to pytorch.org and then go to this menu. So if you scroll down a little bit, there's this menu and then you can select the right version. So in my case, I have a Mac computer, so I would select uh, Mac here. If you have a Linux computer, you would select Linux or if you have a Windows computer, you would select Windows. And then um, you can select how you want to install it. I recommend Conda, but you can also use pip, for example. This is really here only if you want to compile Torch from source. So this is something I probably wouldn't recommend for you. And then yeah, you use your language. So you can also use C++ or Java, but I really recommend also Python. And then the CUDA version, if you don't want to use a GPU, then just select none. So Mac uh, laptops, they have a GPU, some of them, the AMD GPU, but it's not compatible. So if you have a Mac, uh, always select none. And then, yeah, then it will give you a command how you can install PyTorch. So in my case, it would be conda install PyTorch, Torch Vision, Torch Audio, C, PyTorch. So I would just copy that to my terminal and run this command and it should install it. So Torch Vision is like a utility package that has some yeah, data sets and additional function for image processing, which will be useful later. And Torch Audio is for audio data. We won't be working with audio data in this course, but uh, with Torch Vision. I would just recommend copying this and installing everything. Shouldn't hurt. All right, so this is just yeah, about installing PyTorch. If you have any questions, also let me know on Piazza. I can yeah, answer all these questions, hopefully. All right, so in the next video, I will talk briefly about vectors and matrices and the concept of broadcasting. That is like um, some things that are possible on the computer, but not proper linear algebra, but they make our life easier.